joy, peace, tranquility, vibrancy, and wellness. Isn't this what you want instead of constant stress? That's what host Rochelle Lawson is going to help you with on Blissful Living. There are many ways to reduce stress, some you may not even know about. Doesn't a little peace and tranquility sound like just what you've been looking for? Relax for a few minutes with Rochelle. She's the queen of feeling fabulous. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Blissful Living. This is the queen of feeling fabulous, Rochelle Marie Lawson, and... I have a wonderful show set for you today. In today's show, we're going to talk about sunrises and sunsets, and I'll give you a little bit more about that. But before we get started, I want to thank our sponsors. Uh, The first sponsor of uh, this segment is the Health, Healing, and Wellness Company, and you can check them out at, uh, you know, www.health healingwellness.com. They've got some great things that they're kicking off for 2016. Um, It's designed to help you optimize your health and well-being, have more energy, sleep better, have a healthier sex life, uh, lose weight, whatever your focus is for your health and well-being for 2016. I think you definitely want to check out the Health, Healing, and Wellness Company. So again, healthhealingwellness.com for all their wonderful goodies that they have in store for you to help you just have a little bit more easier journey as you travel down your path to bliss. And then the second company is all Day Cable Inc. It's a telecommunications installation company that uh, focuses on uh, network distribution and, and installation of voice data, fiber, and wireless systems for telecommunicating in the global world that we have here. You can check them out at alldaycableinc.com. So I really want to thank our sponsors of today's segment. And let's just jump into the show. Let me tell you a little bit about my guest. Her name is Holly Kelly. She's a gerontologist, a journalist, fellow in thanatology, death, dying, and bereavement, and author of Sunrises and Sunsets, Final Affairs Forged with Flares, Finesse, and Functionality, has awakened the nation on final affairs, planning with her groundbreaking and captivating new book. And I know you guys might be thinking, like, why are we talking about this kind of stuff, or why would we have something like this on the show? But again, uh, the show is designed to help you to reduce or eliminate stress in all aspects of our life, and death is a part of Um, an aspect in our life that we may have to face with a loved one or someone that we know we love and care about. And so anything that I can do to just help you to have a little bit less stress when you come across these areas in your life that you don't always think about or that are not always in the forefront is what I'm here to do for you. Now, Holly Kelly, um, as a gerontologist and founder of the Ladder Life Planning Institute, the ultimate guide for life's final destiny, she, shed, she set out to close the gap on advanced care planning and open the dialogue on death discussions in a written work that would appeal to adults of all ages. But she aimed to do more, and that was to encourage transcendence towards personal peace and stir a new enthusiasm for the present. Now, in the book, Sunrises and Sunsets, Holly tackles the unapproachable topic of final affairs planning with an interactive and entertaining soulful vintage. I can't wait to talk about this. Um, Guidebook, workbook, you know, this book is a little bit of everything for you. This hybrid book is one unique and beautiful, inspiring call to action. And really, again, you guys, it's something that we all need to be thinking about, even though you don't want to think about your death, but it really is something you need to be thinking about with regards to planning um, things as you approach that time in your life. Now, it's full of color photographs to the thought-provoking, optimistic, and witty quotes, and it's genuinely impassioned um, poetry and heart-rendering personal stories. She fashion final affairs planning that appeals to everyone. And so with that, I would like to welcome today's guest to Blissful Living, Holly Kelly. Welcome to Blissful Living, Holly Kelly. Wow, what a wonderful introduction, and thank you so much for the opportunity to share this message and be your guest today. I'm honored. 
Well, thank you. We're very honored to have you. It's, you know, um, as a healthcare professional for all the years I've been doing what I do, um, I have had you know, many experiences with uh, people dying right in front of me or, you know, uh, coming into my clinical setting, which was uh, back then emergency room trauma and, you know, being pretty much dead on arrival and having to, you know, go back and talk to the family about certain things. And sometimes the family wasn't prepared. They didn't know what they were going to do. They didn't know the next steps they were going to, you know, going to take. And, um and a lot of times it caught people off guard. And so whether the person was young or middle-aged or elderly, it still was um, quite uh, awakening to me that no matter what age these people were, there were always those family members that weren't prepared for that particular person's death, whether it was terminal illness or sudden onset. And so I think, you know, when people think about the topic of death and dying, you know, they think of it as a more depressive type of thing, and it's not something that they want to really think about because it does provoke a little bit of stress in people. But you have um, some wonderful information and insight that, you know, I believe will help people to just embrace it just a little bit more and be a little bit more prepared in case it is sudden or terminal um, that will help them have just a little bit less stress uh, if they have to deal with something like this. And so what I want to do is um, I kind of want to jump in because I want to know um, what made you, first of all, go into the area of uh, becoming a gerontologist? Well, I do like that you have addressed multiple times um, the preparedness aspect of what is so important in our lives. And so um, that definitely helps people if they are prepared to get through difficult matters. And it's a game changer as to whether one is prepared or not prepared as to how that situation is faced. So I'm so glad you raised that. I went into the field of gerontology because I've always been extremely comfortable with um, elderly, seniors, even as a very young girl. And so I recognized early on that I had the ability to relate positively and interact well in even complicated and challenging situations. I think of my grandfather, who we loved dearly, uh, but he was uh, challenging and he was cantankerous and I was the only one that could actually manage him, and the family would call on me, and I would just say, Gramps, we're not doing this, and you're not doing this. Life's too short for you to show your ugly side, and he would stop immediately, and nobody else would he do that with. So I recognized early on that I had the ability to somehow tap into uh, that side of older people, and even with clients, I've had... Children call me if they've booked a consultation and try to do a disclaimer on their parent and um, (laughs) how grumpy they might be and give me the opportunity to maybe uh, deny uh, the chance to work with that individual. And I would always say, absolutely not. I'm, I'm, I'm all in. And the experience would go very, very well, and we would connect. And so the the children would always be so shocked, like, what did you do? <laughs> He's awful. And so I did recognize that somehow um, I'm able to uh, share and offer something uh, to even difficult individuals. But I do love um, the elder population. I think they're so beneficial and vital uh, to all other generations. I decided that I would grow that area of interest and become a gerontologist. And throughout my studies, I became extremely fascinated and intrigued by how few people actually plan for advanced directives. Uh, Mm -hmm. Third is the average statistic, while it varies depending on the source. uh, I just thought that for something so vital and so important, that was a little low, extremely low, uh, thinking that every adult should actually implement advanced directives. So I just decided that uh, when I created this work that I would define and develop what I consider to be comprehensive advanced care planning, take it way past the will and the technical things like advanced directives, and grow that into 
what would be so valuable for the individual and enriching and life elevating and soul soothing and allow them to use this opportunity to share their life with those that they love. So that is how the work came to be in, in concept. Wow, that's that's really nice because um you know, as my experience in the uh, clinical setting, it was um, astounding to me how many people did not have a, an advanced directive. And I want to say, you know, I'm going back uh, 26 years. Now, there, you know, there's a lot more people that are in tune to what they need to do and how they need to have that in place. But, I mean, literally, it was it was astounding to me. And it was, I don't know, I don't know if it was a new thing back then or something new that people just started thinking about or, you know, a new field to study. Because even when I was in college, um, you know, going through nursing school, there wasn't uh, any particular facet of gerontology. It wasn't until I went and got an advanced, a graduate degree uh, a few years later that, you know, that became um, an area of focus or an area of study that had its own curriculum. But, you know, the years before it did not. And so it, it always amazed me um, that, you know, here everyone, you know, the moment you're born, you begin to die. And it's, you know, I hate to say it like that, but it's really true. The moment we're born, we, you know, we begin to die. And so it it's amazing that we prepare for all the births and, you know, all the, you know, yummy stuff after birth and all of that, but we don't really prepare for our death. And we don't, you know, always have a game plan set up for the family. Um, and so a lot of times you see families just caught in a a pickle, so to speak, because they don't know what to do and they don't know what the wishes of that person who passed away was. And so they, they play this guessing game and hope they get it right. And it's just wonderful that you've taken this um, very expert field of study and created something that is um, sustaining for not only those that you're planning for, but also for their family members. So that's a beautiful thing. Now, with regards to... Um, your um, book, Sunrises and Sunsets, Final Affairs Force with Flair, Finesse, and Functionality. Um, how did you actually come up with, I want to say, the meat to write such a, you know, such a book? Well, the book was actually began academically, and it culminated my gerontological studies, and I decided for my capstone that I would tackle a written work, and the area that I just really seemed to be drawn to was advanced directives, and I thought, well, that's going to be kind of boring. I need to spice this up, and so I just got my creative juices flowing and thought about if I lost my mother, what would I need? What would I need to know? What would be meaningful? And I just came up with a myriad of different areas that I felt were important for somebody's living life today and enhancing that journey as well as their ultimate departure. And so I wanted to make this book inspiring and make it as much about living as it is preparing for the end. I turned this project in and I received an email from Dr. Bonnie Kim, the director of uh, psychology and um, head of the gerontology at Brunel University. Mm -hmm. She said in this email, I don't think you know what you've done. (laughs) If you ever do anything in your life, you must, 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 I remember three capital must, publish this book. And so I thought, okay, uh, that's a good indicator that I probably got a pretty good grade on that, and I was happy, but I was still living in life's womb of contentment and complacency, and I was all good. And sometimes in life, things have a way of knocking on your door and making you act. So about a month later, I received a phone call from a writer who said her boss had asked her to do a story on my book. And I said, my book, I only turned it into one person. How did you get the book? She goes, oh, everybody's read this book. It's been all over. And I said, okay. So I did that story, 
And she's like, okay, well, I hope you're going to publish this. We need this. People would buy it, and, and we all want a copy. And so I still did nothing. And a great story came out, and I was happy. And then about a month later, I received an email from a perfect stranger, somebody I'd never met, a name I did not know, who had read the book. And it was her words that moved me. And I was in tears when I read this email. And it said how the book had moved her and how she had read every page and she had just lost her father at the age of 94 and how much Mm. she would have loved the book. And she would have been sending him quotes every day from the book to help his journey in his final days. And when I recognized the capacity that this book had to help others, it was in that moment that I looked up and said, okay, I got the memo. I know what I need to do. I'll do it. Um, I will leave my comfort zone and I will do this. Oh, wow. That's that's great. You know, it is funny because you're like, I just did this for a project you know, for my studies, and, you know, it just kind of turned into um, a project for the world. So it, I, it, I could have never seen. It had a life of its own, and it was never about me. It was always about what this book had the capacity to do and how it can reach others and be soul-soothing and help people prepare for their final journey and handle unfinished business, as well as um, allowing them to have a well-orchestrated life moving forward. And so some things in life just happen to you, and I think we need to be good students of life and notice those signs and and act on them. Yeah, I I, I totally agree. You know, sometimes you discount it, you don't see it, you don't, you know, the signs you – you know, you don't think they're real or what you think you're seeing. You don't, you know, you don't, it, it, it's just like, oh, that's not for me. Or, you know what I'm saying? It's like, you just. You oh, just believe me, it. this was like, I was happy living under my rock. And this was <laughs> a very bold move for me. And so I, I just knew that it was the path. And I always say, if you're going to show me signs, make sure I don't need a bread trail crumb. I need loaves of bread hitting me <laughs> upside the head. I'm a tough person to move, and this is what I need. And so um, it even got more interesting because I decided that I'd kind of put my toes in the kiddie pool, and I sent, I created a list of publishers, A-list, A-minus list, B-plus mm-hmm. list, B-list, and my A-list was three. And so I know of writers that have sent their work to hundreds of publishers. So I sent my book off to three, and that was kind of me pretending to be in, but not completely. Right. I was like, okay, I'll go along with this. And everybody that I sent it to, it said that you would hear from them in about three months or more. Uh-huh. And three weeks after sending it, I got a call, which happened to have been on my birthday. Ooh. While my mother was visiting, which is a few times a year. Uh-huh. And it was a publisher saying, we want your book. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. How could this be? I mean, again, more signs in life. And so I think it is so important that we stop and slow down and listen, and not necessarily with our ears, but be aware of what our intended path is because sometimes we'll miss it and we have the opportunity to do so much good and share uh, what we have with the world to make our lives better and certainly elevate the lives around us. Right. I like how you said, I didn't need breadcrumbs. I needed loaves of bread. And that sometimes is so me because sometimes you don't know if the breadcrumbs are really, you know, if they're for real or not. But a loaf of bread hitting you in the head is definitely something you have to pay attention to. So, Oh, yes. That like is... beyond blinking lights and big arrows and loaves of bread. Thank you. <laughs> That's so cool. Now, I know you've been referred to as the death wrangler. Can you explain to the listeners out there what exactly does that mean? Because, you know, the death wrangler sounds like the person that's on the, with the, you know, the, the, what is that, the Grim Reaper kind of, you know. So explain to the listeners what exactly that means. Well, first interview that I shared uh, earlier, the reporter asked me, and I wasn't prepared for this interview, but she asked me, what exactly was it that you wanted to do with death in this book? What did you want to do? Well, those people that uh, know me know that I am a 
enthusiast of Native American Old West cultures. I've been um, had and owned horses and equestrian my entire life, and so it seems that those themes seem to show up in all kinds of places, including my decor and apparently in my writing. And so, when she asked me what I wanted to do with death, I paused for a moment and I said, "Well, I think I wanted to wrangle it. I wanted to be a death wrangler." And I didn't think anything of that. It was just one of many questions she asked me when that article came out in big, giant letters at the top, right above my picture. It said, Death Wrangler. And it was one of those cognomens in life that stick. And so um, it was pretty interesting how that came to be. Now, I recognize we can't wrangle death, that it is uh, the ultimate destiny for all living things. But in a metaphoric kind of philosophical emotional and spiritual way the book when the reader works their way through it they do sort of wrangle death because they've alleviated the fears and they've done what you said early on they are now prepared and i ask the readers in the book are you ready to die in the beginning do you think you're ready to die and i acknowledge that every single reader says absolutely positively not no And in the end of the book, I asked them again. And I said, I didn't ask if you wanted to. I asked if you were ready. Ready. As in prepared. And as you are. Wow. And that's a a big difference, you know, whether you're ready or you're prepared. Because, I mean, you could ask a million or a billion people here on earth, are you ready to die? And everyone's going to say, no. Oh, my gosh, I've got so much to do. I've got so much living to You know, I've got this, you know, all this stuff. But when you say, are you prepared, it's, a thought, it's thought-provoking because it's like, what exactly do you mean, am I prepared? You know, when I die, I die. I don't need to prepare for that. But in actuality, you do. And, um, and it's good that we have you and we have this wonderful book, Sunrises and Sunsets, um, because now people can be prepared without, quote-unquote, being ready. And so that's that's a beautiful thing. Now, as I stated earlier, you know, you're a gerontologist and a fellow in, is, am I saying this right, thanatology? Thanatology. Yes, you did. Mm-hmm. What exactly is thanatology? Thanatology is the study of death and dying. Mm. So somebody in that field has an understanding of the body of knowledge in the areas of death, dying, and bereavement. So, um, And then gerontologist is often misunderstood, and that is someone that engages in the study of aging, problems of the age. Of course, you know that uh, mm-hmm. with your uh, career. But uh, a lot of people don't know what a gerontologist is. <laughs> I say, and a lot of people think I'm a dermatologist. I'm like, no. <laughs> So, um, and gerontologists can be an array of different areas, social, psychological, cognitive, um, biological studies um, that they focus on. So it's very diverse and multidisciplinary, as is thanatology. So that's my area of emphasis. Wow. So now with regards to, um, you know, just the study of aging and the whole concept of gerontology, um, what is one thing that you would like for the listeners to know that they probably don't know that will help them to understand um, the complexity of, you know, what what it's all about? Well, I think it's important, and I do this in the book, to remind people that every day is a gift. And I know we say that and we hear that, but do we truly embrace it? Because we really just don't know. We do know that there's a departure. We know that there's an end time to our mortal existence. But are we living our life in the spirit of which we are truly, truly grateful for that? And if we're not, there's so many things that are bogging us down. And it can be many things. It could be unresolved issues, and um, which in the book, the Kick the Bucket List, uh, helps you deal with. But I want to be sure that people are truly facing their daily situations and events with the most positive outlook and perspective because we all know and studies show that one's perspective, one's attitude is so 
important as it relates to all other things. You know this in your profession. I was on your website. You are all about this. <laughs> and how important it is that we have positive thoughts and we don't let little things interfere with the life experience. I think sometimes we get so comfortable with everything working and flipping on a light switch and that there's light. So we get inconvenienced as we age by things that really, in the grand scheme of things, are affecting our life experience, but they're just really not that important and we don't have to let them. So I think it's important that we slow down, we self-assess, and we do make sure that we're living our best life now with the most positive outlook and we're really getting an enriching experience about that because you can't give away what you don't have. When right. you're happy, everybody around you is. So I think that's important is to not look at aging as a terrible journey. But in fact, um, the second half of life, I would venture to say, could very well be more dynamic and amazing than the first half and look at that as yet another journey of which to enjoy and savor. You know, this is very interesting because I had a client I was dealing with this week, and he's a 78-year-old gentleman, and he's a physicist, um, laser, laser physicist. And so we're, you know, we're joking around, and I'm like, oh, you're, you're, you know, you're smart. You're like a rocket scientist, and, you know, and I'm, I'm saying, I can't believe that you're actually enjoying our conversation and you're laughing because you actually have a personality. Most rocket scientists, you know, or people that are super smart like you, physicists, um, really are just kind of cut and dry. And he laughed and he laughed and he, he said, well, first of all, I'm not super smart. And I go, oh, yeah, you are. You're a physicist. You do things that, you know, you did things in your mind that people... I couldn't I couldn't even equate to begin to do. He goes, Well, you know when I was younger, I had no personality and I really was focused on um, you know, doing what I did and you know, I he goes, I never thought I was really smart, I just thought I had a really keen interest in phys- physics, right? And so he says, I worked at Berkeley um, Laboratory for years and years, and that's where he retired. But he said, as I began to age and as I got closer to the point of retirement, I realized that I was not living a life that was enjoyable. I was not allowing myself to be free to engage in the everyday aspects of life because I was too caught up in the the physics of how everything worked and the molecular science of it all. And I couldn't engage in a normal conversation with someone because I, I just, I, he, he said he just couldn't let himself relax down to that level. He said, but once he retired, he began to, you know, realize that all that stuff he was doing, and yeah, it was great, and he worked on some wonderful projects and all of that. It was all great for the development of our society today, but in hindsight, it didn't really make his life any different or any better. And what it did was it actually took him away from it took him away from being able to enjoy the aspects of everyday normal life that people typically enjoy. He said, I never took time to watch sports. And he goes, and now I engage in sports and I actually love it. He goes, it wasn't that I didn't love it or like it. I just felt that I didn't have the time to do that because I had so many more important things to do. And he goes, looking back on his life, he realizes that he wasted a lot of time doing stuff that really wasn't important to anybody and really not to him because he be, he was isolating himself from the everyday aspects of life. And I thought, you know, we you know, I thought you know we're having this conversation and we're going back and forth, but after he left, I thought, wow, you know, he was really um in touch with where he is now with regards to his aging process. And it may be because he's, you know, aging and he's becoming more wiser and he's not holding on to stuff. But for him to say what he said, that he really didn't allow himself to enjoy the everyday aspects of life, the simple little things in life like, you know, the sun shining or the clouds in the sky or the rain falling or, you know, watching athletics or whatever, um, he didn't allow himself to engage in that, and he actually felt that he, you know, really deprived himself of a really good part of it, part of life that he should have been having a lot more, 
um, fun with and being a lot more happier. And so when you said what you said, it just I was just like, wow, that made me think of that gentleman because I think sometimes people forget <clears throat> that, you know, everyone has challenges and we walk down our path and we all are going to die. I mean, regardless of it, you know, we're all going to die until they discover something to keep us alive forever. But, um, you know, it, it, it really is just uh, being happy and allowing yourself to be happy that you exude in it, that out, that energy out to others. Um, and you touch the life of so many others when you are able to be present and enjoy, you know, yourself with life as well. So, um, again, your your work and your studies and what you do is just absolutely phenomenal. And I just um, I just can't wait to learn more about about what's in this book because I think everyone needs to be in the process of process of planning for their death and not in a bad way but in a very good, wholesome, loving, and happy and energetic way. And so um, thank you again for providing such a wonderful book. Now, you, you told us about how the book really, you know, you came came about. It was a project, you know, that you basically turned in and, you know, your your professor loved it and you got a great, you know, you got a great grade based on the email that you received from the professor. And you kind of, you know, always had a uh, – an inkling or a liking, liking or the wherewithal, I don't know if that's the right word either, to deal with elderly people. Because some people don't like elderly people and they don't like to deal with them because they can be very cantankerous and, um, you know, mean and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But you didn't have a problem dealing with that. If there was one thing that you could say or share with the, the listeners with regards to um, – just embracing the elderly and the age, the whole aging process, what would you say? I would definitely um, reflect back on the story you just shared and think about how this gentleman had evolved and what capacity he had in his late 70s to allow you the chance to stop and think about your life. So I do think that... Um, the older generation has so many lessons to teach us. And he recognized that the mass chaos of living day to day in his younger life had robbed him a little bit along the way. And he wanted to turn around and make that right. So I think that it was awesome that he had that self-reflection. And I talk about these sorts of things in the book, how worry is if it rains or shines and you have a party. Uh, just go to plan B and roll with it. And right. so I think it's important that we understand that other people's plight and journey is unto their own, and we don't know what they're going through. But a lot of older people may be very well uh, frustrated and cantankerous because they're used to being able uh, to have the ability to do things with much more ease. And it's tough waking up with your joints hurting and aches and pains. It's tough where uh, you, at one point in your life, were able to see things, and now you have sight and visual impairment, and that is frustrating. And it's challenging to have mobility issues and to have memory issues and for them to appear to be annoyed or challenging to us, I think if we had empathy and understanding as to their plight, because one thing I can assure each of us, if we're lucky, we'll be there because we're all aging together. Um, so I think to give away the very thing that we would want, and they want the same thing we want. They want to be relevant. They don't want to be invisible. They want to be approachable. They want to be loved just like the rest of society. So I think it's important that we treat them like the relevant, incredible, brilliant citizens that they are and embrace that because we're all going to be there if we're lucky enough to make it to that journey. And so I think it's just so important that we um, make sure that we have understanding of what any age is going through. 
Oh, that's beautiful. Very beautifully said. God, I just got this like warm, fuzzy feeling, you know, listening to you because it's, it really is so true. And how often we forget, you know, when you see elderly people. Uh, just the, just yesterday I was walking and there was this little elderly lady and, you know, everybody's just brisking past her, you know, just and she had her little three-legged cane, and, you know, she's walking. Her hair's all white. You know, she's all hunched over, just, you know, and I walked past her, and then I, like, wait a minute, I'd slow down and, like, you know, slow down and kind of backed up to her and, you know, I'm just, you know, said, how's your, how are you doing? And she's like, oh, fine. I'm like, do you need any help with anything? And she was like, oh, no, honey, I'm good. She goes, I'm just, I move a little slow, but I get to where I need to go. And I thought, how cute cute was that and you know she thanked me but so many times that just you know was like a metaphor for me because so many times we just brush through our day and brush through our life and you know you see these elderly people and no one really stops to say hi to them or ask them if they need help or ask them how their day is and when you do their face lights up and and you know even the ones that are cantankerous and you know mean spirited or whatever they appreciate the just someone acknowledging them because they are they're not invisible and a lot of times people just think you know treat the elderly like they're invisible and they're not and we're all going to get there if we're lucky you know to that point and so it's it's just beautiful what you said now i want to get go back to the book a little bit um you know your you, your book is in color and it includes photographs and quotes and poetry which is kind of unique in the whole whole scheme of things when you think about writing a book or anybody that's written a book you know Usually you get a book, you open it up, it's black and white, you know, black words on white pages or cream color pages or eggshell pages, whatever you want to call it. And, you know, it's, it's you know, I want to say like, it's like a, um, I don't want to say dissertation, but it's just like a, a, a piece of written work, right? Not a lot of times there's not color, it's there's no color in it and definitely no photographs. And, and if it's a book that's written, if it's not a book that's just about poetry, there's no poetry in there. And you might get a few quotes in there, but generally it's just words written on a page. Your book includes all of those things. You know, why did you decide to go to a format where it's colorful and you got photog- photographs in there and, you know, quotes and poetry in this book that's all about planning the process of making things smoother for, you know, your death. Why did you decide to do that? This book is a total mashup. It is a collage of all kinds of things, as is life, and we never know what to expect. And so it was important for me to do a couple of things, and that was to keep the readers on the journey and complete what was extremely important in the overall goal, which which was to work their way through the book. And so I wanted them to anticipate the next page and think, okay, my goodness, that was pretty neat. Oh, my goodness, that was funny. Ooh, that was deeply resonating. Ooh, that spoke to me. But I wanted them to think about what's waiting on the next page. What's that next quote going to be? How will this be addressed? And so it was important for me to allow the book to be a journey of which the reader could engage. And I say, my name is on the cover. However... The reader themselves is the final author of this book. They make it unique. They bring it to life. They make it theirs. And so it was so important for me to speak to a variety of people that share uh, varying perspectives and appeal to a mass group of people so that I could ensure that it was a pleasant an enriching experience for them. And so that's why every once in a while there's uh, a poem. Uh, there's quotes all throughout it. It's color. And I recognize that writing a book on the topic of death may put some people off. So I wanted to let them know what they were in for, which was a pleasant journey. Um, the title, Final Affairs Forged with Flair, Finesse, and Functionality, F-U-N, capitalized, lets people know that okay, perhaps I can do this. This may be gratifying. And I think that she's saying it's going to be fun, really? So let me begin on this journey. And right away, I think that they're disarmed and they're like, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. So 
now, it's kind of like a hybrid book. I mean, it's it's uh, it is different, and uh, people are calling it a hybridized book. I like how you said that you wanted to keep them engaged because the uh, the whole topic is it, it can be heavy. You know, it can be heavy, and um, and you wanted to keep them engaged, and so. Um, the premise kind of like I guess how it evolved was that um, it wasn't really a book about what you had to say, but it was a book about the experience the person's going through as they go through the book. It becomes that person's book, and each book that is out there is that person who has it. It's their own unique book, so to speak. So I like that because um, it makes it, even though it's a book that, Anyone and all of us can buy, when we buy it, it becomes our own personal book, our own personal journey, our own personal plan. And I think um, because you have included the color and the photographs and the quotes and the poetry, it will help people to become more engaged and stay engaged in a topic that sometimes can be very hard for people or sometimes very difficult and heavy for others to deal with. So I really, really, really like that. It seems like it's... um, you know, it could be a very fun process to go through reading your book, but making the book my own, so to speak. So I think that's really, really, really cool. Now, you know, as authors, because I'm an author as well, as authors, you know, we have these challenges that come up when we're working on our masterpieces, so to speak. And, um, What were some of the challenges you encountered with writing this book, with particular, you know, to the the topic of the book? (laughs) And that that was the number one challenge in (laughs) the topic. Um, Gee, who wants to buy a book about planning for their own death? No, thank you. I'll wait. Uh, (laughs) Not today. And so that was uh, issue number one, which is why I tackled it with this hodgepodge of different incorporations to keep it light. And uh, all throughout the book, I tell people, if you want more information, we're going to scratch the surface here. But if I went deep, you guys wouldn't turn the page. And so there's always the opportunity for people to gain more knowledge on a topic that we explore on their own. But I recognized that I needed to keep this light, scratch the surface, get the job done that was, you know, of epic uh, importance, and to make sure that I never went too technical, that I never went too academic, and that I kept it light. So that was my first challenge, was how to make death, the conversation of death, both personally and with your family members, something that was enjoyable. The second challenge was the one-size-fits-all dilemma. Mm. How do I make this book appeal to a vast array of potential readers? And that is where the workbook itself comes into play. There may be sections that don't apply, and you would skip those sections um, if there's a certain question in there that doesn't seem to be applicable then you would go to the next question. And so it is a book that is very much able to appeal to a wide range of readers, and it is for any adult of any age because the book is allowed to grow with you as your life changes and as your life journey reveals new perspectives and new understandings um, and new uh, desires. You may start out saying that you want this, and um, you could remarry, have additional children be born, and now your life maybe is in a different direction, and and you've grown, and as have the information that you've written in the book. So you're able to update it and change it. And then I think that um, the last uh, challenge was to make sure that I had a venue where the readers could take ownership of this work and that they could be engaged in the process and lose themselves in what it really was and be able to put their fingerprint on what they wanted it to be and buy into the process that this is the written version of your legacy. This is Mm -hmm. an opportunity to continue to share your love long after your departure. When you think about your loved ones picking up this book and reading, smiles are going to be generated, laughter, love, tears, all of it. And you have the capacity to keep your legacy alive and to continue to provide love and support 
long after your mortal departure. And so Mm -hmm. I think that people recognize as soon as they get into this that this is epically huge and this isn't a time for me to cut corners. I'm all in. It's a call to action, and the readers so far have said call to action, gentle, nurturing, and it's it's a get or done approach that is in a healthy and enjoyable, enriching manner. Mm, very nice. I, I love it. Now, um, you know, you had those challenges with re- with regards to writing, but what would you say would be a favorite part of the book that you just really, really enjoyed chunking out? Well, I would say that. The section, believe it or not, on funerals is a great (laughs) section because I know people are surprised, but it's an opportunity to really orchestrate your last public performance. And it is a chance for you to really show the world what mattered to you and to instore and restore healing with your survivors. So... I address it that think about the funerals you've been to and what they were like to you and think about the ones that truly you left there feeling like the individual had truly been honored for the incredible life they had lived. And what was what was it about that experience that made it unique and special? And so I encourage everybody in the book to plan their own funeral. I give them ideas of different ways that they can do that. There's worksheets in there, and the worksheets make it so easy. Uh, From, you know, flowers, um, songs, who's speaking, um, and how you make it unique. And people get pretty creative in this area, and it's funny uh, and enjoyable, and it's like this secret that they're keeping, even though they're like, okay, I'm pretty sure I won't be there. I don't really know what happens when we die. I mean, maybe I'm there to watch all of this. But right. I can guarantee you this is going to blow their minds and it's going to stay, take the sting out of this awful day of grief and bereavement. They're going to laugh at what I have orchestrated for them. So um, that section I love. The me, myself, and I section is an opportunity for you to share your life story in incredible detail. And through the questions that are answered there, you enjoy this and you're smiling as you complete it because you're hitting rewind and you're going back in your life to your earliest memories and the people that matter to you and the lessons that you learned and what life lesson you want to share with those that you love and care about. And so it's a very enriching section of the book. And then my third favorite section is the letters to loved ones that I have my readers write that are just incredibly beautiful in a way for them to continue their love in written form long after their departure. So I encourage people to write these letters throughout your life course because we just don't know. I've written them for my children in the event that uh, life takes my life before I'm ready and before it's my time. Then my daughter would have that envelope that reads, To My Beautiful Girl on Your Wedding Day. And she's able to open that sealed envelope throughout her life milestones. And my son, to my son, when you become a dad, and they're missing you for these huge life events, and yet you get to be there. You get to share your words, and they echo and resonate on these days that uh, you have planned on. So I think it's just important that the letters to loved ones help soothe the souls of those we leave behind. Wow, that's beautiful. Okay, listeners out there, she just shared several wonderful things that you can do, um, even if you never pick up the book, but I highly suggest that you do pick it up. She shared several wonderful things, and as she was talking about them, it kind of, you know, touched my, my soul and touched my heart because I always – told my kids ever since they were little and I don't know where I got this and I've been to a lot of funerals in, in my family but and they were all different but I always I told my kids that when I die I want them because I'm like the you know the queen of feeling fabulous I want them to I want to be um, taken to the cemetery if it's a you know if they can afford it or if it's affordable if I planned correctly um, 
And, you know, you see the horse-drawn carriages where they, you know, I, I've always, I don't know, I think they do that a lot. I just remember a lot of that, like, happening in Louisiana. I don't know. And so I always thought that was just the coolest thing. It was like Cinderella, you know, last journey. And um, and so I told my kids that when they were little, and it's so funny. You know, they're, like, grown now, and they always remember that, me, remember me telling them. They, they can remember where we were, what kind of, I was driving, they were in the back seat, I'm telling them, I, I mean, probably because we passed a funeral and, they, and someone was doing that, and they all, they remember the exact, you know, the exact moment I told them, and it was just, the, and they were little, little kids, but it was funny because, you know, they remember that. <laughs> Every but, conversation a kid wants to have with their parents, I know, okay, now, if I pass, this is how this is going to work. <laughs> so funny and then I just think of like the very first funeral that I experienced was my grandfather uh, my paternal grandfather he was Sicilian and it was like this it was you know as I was eight so it was like oh my gosh you know my beloved grandfather passed away you know and you know, everyone should be, you know, sad and crying, and they were the moment he passed away, but the funeral was, like, so festive and joyful, and after the funeral, there was, they had this, you know, this big, huge party, and, you know, and I thought, you know, that's how I want, that's how I want things to be for me. I don't want people sitting around mourning and crying, and, you know, I want people to engage in the fact that, you know, I've gone on and be happy and joyful. And, and that, so that was one of the other things I picked up, you know, it's like, I want that carriage. Of course, I want my last Cinderella ride. But then also, I want it to be a festive event. I don't want it, people to be mourning my life. I want them to celebrate my life. And then you, you talk about the letters, and I thought, wow, you know, how cool, how cool would that be if, you know, just using my grandfather, you know, when I got married, if there was a letter from him to me on my wedding day or because I was extremely close to him um, or if, you know what I'm saying, it's just these little things that you don't think about. But when you talked about it, it just brought a smile to my face because it doesn't have to be a solemn experience. It can be very joyful and lively and, and happy, you know, and you can do whatever you want to do as long as you plan ahead for it and let those you know, let those who are left behind know what your wishes are, like how you, who you want to speak. And, you know, I thought, wow, that, that's so, that's really, really so cool. And you don't know if the people are there and their soul is looking down as they, you know, the a process of their funeral, if they're watching and looking and, you know, we don't know that. But wouldn't it be cool if you, if you could see, you know, you pass away and you look down and, you're present and you see all these people and, you know, they're celebrating your life and, you know, talking about what you, the legacy you left with regards to the things you did because you planned appropriately. And so um, lots of, lots of wonderful things that you just shared. Now, I'm okay, I can go on and on and on, but we're coming up for time. And I want to really get to um, what you do. So you've written this wonderful book. Now, how, um, how, is the continuum going? Because I know you do some things with workshops. So can you just tell the listeners a little bit about, you know, now that they've got the book and they want to engage in a little bit more work with you, tell them a little bit about your workshops that you have. Okay. The uh, Sunrises and Sunsets workshops are a great way to work the book in a social setting and to forge new friendships and um, try to even make the ones you have uh, go reach a deep, deeper level. And so the groups are able to be formed. You would go to my website, which is the www.sunrisesandsunsetsbook.com, and you would request a workshop or share that you have a group that is interested in one. And so through the group approach, a lot of laughter takes place, (laughs) and the conversations expand, and they go in different directions, and ideas are shared. And so each workshop is unique. Uh, they're guaranteed to be fun. And it also it cures any tendencies for procrastination. When the workshop is over, this book is done, and you've done what you need to do for yourself and for those that you love. And so uh, there will also be the Leader's Guide up, hopefully by the end of this weekend, where if somebody says, you know what, okay, I'm not going to have Holly lead my workshop, but I want to lead my dinner club or my church group or spiritual group or my book club. 
my civic or social organization I'm going to lead. And so the leader's guide is kind of a teacher's guide to what I do when I lead the workshops. So we're hosting them all throughout. Um, right now I have people to host where I can't get. I do have just wonderful uh, professionals that can handle that all throughout the South, and um, we're expanding as we have requests. Where are you located? Huntsville, Alabama. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Just to give the listeners so, you know, if, if people are more on the East um, or close to you, it may be more, you know, feasible to have you come in and if they're like way over here on the west coast you know there's there's other avenues for them to engage in this wonderful workshop shop process and, and make it fun and lively and um very engaging now with regards to um the book how can people get a copy of the book well, they, I invite them and encourage them to go on my website and learn more about Sunrises and Sunsets and other planning initiatives. Uh, there is a special section there just for readers of the book uh, that is available to them. So the Sunrises and Sunsets, and it's A-N-D, plural on Sunrises and Sunsets, book.com. And they can also subscribe. I give away a free book a month. So it's available for purchase on my website. If Amazon is more convenient or Barnes & Noble, it's also available there. And so it's available really wherever fine books are sold. Uh, But I would love to have people also visit the website just to get a different approach and um, additional ideas that I have for planning that didn't make the book um, because the book can only be so big. So anyway, the Sunrises and Sunsets book.com. Thank you for sharing that. So you guys out there listening, you have an idea where you can get the book and pick up the book. But before we let Holly go, there's one other thing that I want her to share. Now, you founded the Ladder Life Planning Institute. Can you quickly tell us a little bit about that? Well, we all have a journey that we're on, and uh, the Ladder Life Planning Institute is there to address uh, and provide guidance for life's inevitable journey. That journey is aging. And it's also our final departure. And so I specialize in the area of promoting enhanced aging experiences to encourage people to live their life through their bucket list Mm -hmm. and to find meaning in the everyday spirit of life. And so um, I also help groups, businesses, and individuals and families prepare uh, for their comprehensive advanced care planning initiatives, and I provide education through the Ladder Life Planning Institute of how to best connect and relate uh, to the elderly generation and things that maybe that they think is the best thing to do. They may just be misunderstood, and so it's important that businesses who cater to seniors actually really understand uh, what the generation needs and what serves them best. And so I just really focus in the uh, second side of life in preparing people for vivacious aging and also for departing. Beautiful. Well, it's been a pleasure to have you, Holly. And again, what a wonderful piece of work that you're doing. And I love everything we talked about with regards to sunrises and sunsets, final affairs, forged with flair, fitness, and functionality. It it just takes a really heavy subject and topic for most people, and it makes it fun and engaging and enlightening and beautiful and happy, and, you know, and it actually allows the person to be in control of their, you know, their final departure, so to speak. So, Thank you, thank you, thank you for the work that you're doing for this awesome book. Um, I can't wait to get it and, uh, you know, begin engaging in the process and just going through the exercises. I think it's just going to be a hoot, you know, um, because it's, it's, it's something that we don't normally think about or do. And so thank you for being a guest on Blissful Living. And um, do you have any last words or anything final that you want to say? Well, I just want to thank you for the work that you do and all of the different ways that you promote and enhance people's life journey and allowing um, guests such as myself to be able to share their work and elevate humanity. So I appreciate that you're out there connecting with your listeners and bringing information that can help them 
and those that they love. So I want to thank you for the opportunity of being your guest today. Oh, thank you. That's so sweet. You're just a you're just a gem. You are just a diamond in Huntsville, Alabama. <laughs> That's beautiful. <laughs> well, to all of you out there listening, thank you for tuning in to Blissful Living. It has been my honor and my pleasure to bring the fabulous Holly Kelly with her wonderful topic of sunrises and sunsets, final affairs, fours with flair, finesse, and functionality. I highly suggest that you go pick up this book, whether you pick it up for yourself or someone that you love and care about. Pick up this book. Go to her book, her website, sunrisesandsunsetsbook.com. And again, I guarantee that it'll be a fun process for you, and it'll just give you a whole new span on the whole process of planning for your final departure or the you know, those that you love and care about. I am Rochelle Marie Lawson, the queen of feeling fabulous. And until next week, I'm wishing you peace to your mind, wellness to your body, and tranquility to your spirit. Good day and bye for now. You can find out more about Rochelle on her website, Rochelle Lawson, R-O-C-H-E-L-E, Lawson, L-A-W-S-O-N, or at healthhealingwellness.com. Or just click on her websites from the webtalkradio.net page right in front of you. And of course, you'll want to come right back here next week for another episode of Blissful Living. Thanks for joining us.